what, what tends to happen is comedians will turn up to another country and I go, oh, I've got this word, a duvet. Do you have duvets over here? Because that's yeah. the punchline to the joke. And I go, oh, no, they're called donors, mate. And you're like, oh, okay, right, I've got to change that bit. Does that work? But the essence of, of all comedy is about people. I wanted to start by talking about stand-up comedy and take it all the way back to when you first started and ask you, what made you want to first start doing stand-up comedy? Um, I think uh, for me, I, I love watching comedy and uh, loving how everyone seemed to love the comedian, the, the funniest person in the room or yeah. the person that's got the best joke. Everyone seemed to warm to them. And I, I kind of wanted to be that person because I enjoyed watching it so much. Um, and that, that's, that's what I did. I, I wanted to do stand-up comedy. All my mates at school, when I was at secondary school, were like, yeah, but there's one flaw, Tom, you're not funny. And I was like, yeah, that's... <laughs> that's that is harsh, uh, but okay, well, I'll work on it. Um, and I went to university and, and got an opportunity to, to do some stand-up comedy and, and never looked back really. And, and also the idea that I can get paid to do something you love mm. and never have to work in an office, not knocking people who work in an office, mm. but just for me, I, I wanted to be out there, basically be lazy and play PlayStation as much as possible <laughs> and then work in the evening. But it gave me that outlet and, um, yeah, like I said at the beginning of this podcast, I I I'd, I feel very lucky that some I'll get found out at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's thirteen years now of doing stand up comedy. Wow. Absolutely love it. Wouldn't be without it. Awesome. But obviously, that first time that you ever perform in front of a crowd must have been terrifying, surely. So I wondered if you could give us a story from your first gig. <laughs> <laughs> uh, putting me on the spot. First gig. Well, oddly enough, in Southampton, that's where I'm from. Mm. Uh, there used to be an open mic night. Um, at a place called the Talking Heads, which doesn't exist anymore. And what they used to do, you'd get there early and you say, can I perform 10 minutes? Uh, and there was a massive traffic light in the corner of the, the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'd be green until six minutes. Then it would go amber for the last two. And then red means you need to wrap up. You've got like mm -hmm. a little bit of time left. And, and I was just so excited to, to perform. And I'd, I'd written down some jokes and I thought, yeah, I'm funny. I back myself. I've got this. So I went down with a good mate at the time called Ryan O'Reilly, he's, uh, mm. he's a professional musician. Uh, he's brilliant, love him to bits. He went down with me and he, he just told me at college, he was like, oh, I, I play the guitar. And at the time I was like, everyone said that, you know, like a Jack Johnson, mm. Banana Pancakes, whatever that song was, right? And you'd be like, oh, really, you're a guitarist? Okay, why don't you go on before me and I'll go on after you? He absolutely obliterated the room. He was such a talented guy and I didn't know that. And I backed out. My first gig didn't oh, really? actually happen because I pulled out. <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> choked. I was at the back of the room and I asked, you know, like a uh, girlfriend at the time, family members, best mates, I'm doing my first gig. And everyone was like, tell everybody Tom's doing his first gig. Let's see if he can do it. Choked. Having to go around to everybody when they were sat at their table going, I'm not going to go on. I'm really so I'm not. I, I just can't. I just don't feel like. And I've never not gone on stage again. But uh, that, that's that's a fun memory because it was that yeah. turning point. I was like, you can't invite people along and then not perform. Um, so yeah, but, but that, that's one of them. And then actually performing at a professional comedy night, the first ever time. Again, I asked mates down and then knew that I couldn't back out of it. Mm -hmm. Got on stage, um, had some, had some jokes that went down well and then never looked back really. Amazing mate. And then that obviously progressed to you and in the 2007 Chortle student comedian of the year award massive belated congratulations mate of about 13 <laughs> years late here. first of all don't do that no <laughs> one does that i didn't know no yeah no because it was a small small award uh i, I don't think anyone in the last 13 years has said by the way tom congratulations <laughs> on the chore that's the first time that's ever happened alex but I've, I've gone onto youtube before and looked at the chortle um student comedy award videos of people who've then gone on to be massive comedians so for example like simon bird uh you're talking about ed gamble these kind of names mm. who were you up against to beat and win that award Ooh, uh well it was the edinburgh festival uh your heat my heat that i had was in southampton and because it was sponsored by Ch um, Revels, that was it, mm. Revels that year, everyone who got knocked out in the, in the uh, preliminary round, I guess, got a box of Revels, like a big <laughs> box of them. And I was a bit annoyed, actually, because I didn't get a box of Revels, but I went through <laughs> to the final, finished university. So this is my last year ever of, of entering that competition. I believe the year before Nathan Caton won it, who's a, who's a fantastic comic that I still work with. 
uh, my year, Simon Bird got knocked out because he deliberately broke the rules. Uh, he wasn't supposed to mention Revels in his in his comedy skit or, or set, but he did that, and he he just read out the rules. Uh, and it was <laughs> a, like a funny, funny man is Simon Bird. Yeah. I don't need to explain who he is to people from the in betweeners. But I went to the final, definitely Ed Gamble, and it would probably annoy uh, any other comedian who was in that heat or the final that that didn't that I don't mention now. But it was it was a really really tough. Uh, competition and again I invited lots of mates along to mm. be in the crowd um, because they were all up there it was this was our sort of final year um, and to win it uh, was mad got 2,500 pounds and no revels so again I was no more revels. annoyed <laughs> about I didn't get any free revels <laughs> but that actually with this with this podcast about travel the, the other prize was to be flown out to Canada so I'd never done a nice. long-haul flight went to Toronto to compete in the great Canadian yuck yuck laugh off it's called it's a particular comedy club there so that was my first travel and I, I definitely got a taste uh, for traveling then brilliant and I wanted to talk about Edinburgh Fringe because obviously that's where the uh, final was taking place I've been to Edinburgh Fringe Edinburgh Festival before 25 days of comedy like it's absolutely incredible for the uh, audience but what's it like for the comedian the opposite Alex. <laughs> it's the opposite anybody listening you want to go up and see people broken <laughs> it's like, kind of like a roller coaster um where you know where Ronan Keaton said you just got to ride it it's hard in Edinburgh because you're up and down your mood swings one minute it's raining it's chucking it down you've got no audience in your room or and then the other days it's packed and it's just it's a roller coaster of, of adrenaline emotions and if you do want to see one of your favorite comics broken that's the place to go and to go and find them on the street uh wandering around handing out flyers but uh it, yeah it's it's it, it, it's an amazing festival uh i'd done four solo shows there i don't plan to go back anytime soon because i don't fancy losing more money because that's yeah. the thing that's yeah. the thing that, that cuts us deep i think the most expensive edinburgh i had was twelve thousand pounds i was out of pocket at the end but here's the the positive side uh that was a show i was doing about completing a 2010 world cup sticker album mm. which then from that led on to doing the euro fan um, nice so everything happens for a reason. And I think I've just paid it off uh, 10 years on. So well done to me. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on Edinburgh as a city though? Beautiful. I like stunning place. I, I love it. Um, around the Arthur's seat is a great walk. Mm. Uh, you, you go up there. The, the people are brilliant outside of the festival because people have to understand the whole of Edinburgh still carries on, but a lot of the people that live there move out so they can charge mm. three times the <laughs> amount on their rent. And uh, to, so they, it, you know, one month they can pay off three months because you're you're paying so much to to go and stay mm. there. But the city's beautiful. The food's amazing. I took my girlfriend last year. We went up and loved it. But we now want to explore more of Scotland because she was like, I've got a taste for it. I want to go and see more. And that's the beauty. You don't get to see that during the festival. You're you're so concerned. You're you're fixated on how many people are in my room. Yeah. Uh, is this joke funny enough? <laughs> when are the reviewers coming in? you don't get to appreciate how beautiful like the meadows are in, in Edinburgh. But, um, but yeah, I, I'd love to go back, just not at the festival. Yeah. Don't blame me, mate, after hearing that. So I want to speak about some more places that comedy has taken you. You mentioned Canada and Edinburgh, but where's the most obscure place that comedy has ever taken you? Obscure. Wow. I wasn't expecting that as a question. <laughs> where's obscure? I, um, New Zealand was, uh, uh, an amazing adventure that I went on um, because I, because there's moments in your life. I think when I look back to places I've traveled to, it's a point in my life. And I go, Oh, I love that because of, I was going through this in my life or mm. I'd just gone through a breakup and, or, you know, this was going on in my work life. So you have those memories mm. uh, and New Zealand was, it was a great place. It's performing in the little tiny places that were great, but actually Australia now to come to think of it I did a gig in a place called Capella which I think has an, a, a population of maybe 500 it's just wow. a road it's just it, it you you sort of look left and right and then you've gone past Capella that's it <laughs> and I performed there on the Sydney sorry the Melbourne Comedy Festival Roadshow flown out for two and a half weeks to go to a different town every night and these are the the really 
backward like no one really goes there on holiday places mm. and capella was odd it was in their hall their town hall i think the whole town was in there if you can call them a town um very obscure but they 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 loved you more because you'd come to their little place mm. um so i think that's a, a i probably crashed and burned like i did on most of those gigs uh but i um yeah th that was obscure because of the, the the size of the town and doing a gig there yeah so obviously Aussies are renowned for having a good sense of humour. Mm. But what's it like going around the world, performing to different countries, different sense of humours? Do you find that your jokes land better in some countries than others? Yeah, I think you can get a, a, a sense of it. A, a lot of the gigs that I do in Europe, I did one earlier in 2020 uh, in Vienna and Budapest, and you've got a lot of expats who are there. So you mm. connect with them on the... I'll tell you what, mate, it's nice to be here rather than England. Let me tell you the problems with England and yeah. then they can connect with you. So it's about you connecting uh, with that audience because a lot of the comedy, as long as it's, what, what tends to happen is comedians will turn up to another country and I go, oh, I've got this word, a duvet. Do you have duvets over here? Because that's yeah. the punchline to the joke. And I go, oh, no, they're called donors, mate. And you're like, oh, okay, right, I've got to change that bit. Does that work? But the essence of, of all comedy is about people mm. and connecting and whether it's about relationships or random obscure things, people will, will get that. Just some of the words you have to change so that they, they're on board with the story takes the, the most amount of time. But what I love <laughs> about that two and a half weeks in Australia, come to think of it, was a girlfriend at the time kept banging on about Australia. Oh, I'd love to go to Australia. I want to go to Australia. And I was like, oh, couldn't think of anything worse. Australians, so annoying, noisy, <laughs> just full of themselves. Nah, not for me. I'd rather go to America. I quite like America. Then I get offered the, we'll fly you out for two and a half weeks, Tom, come, come across. <laughs> I went there and I was like, nah, I'm probably not going to like it, but a gig's a gig. I'll enjoy it. I fell in love with the place and as really? soon as i got back i was like oh we have to go to australia this is a place oh, the people <laughs> that warmth you get and it, it it definitely did come across when um uh doing the gigs that they are a kind of bubbly lively people like if you come in miserable they don't particularly like that they like mm. the upbeat sort of style so um so i did actually go down well there but yeah would love to go back awesome man and of course you must be missing stand-up this year we spoke about it before you came on the podcast about you performing on zoom how does that differ? And it sounds like a stupid question. I've just said it out loud and it sounds like a stupid question. How does that differ to performing live? Uh, well, for example, in this uh, flat that my girlfriend and I rent, uh, it's not, I'd never had a gig before where my girlfriend will sort of come on the stage and go, you're shouting, I can hear you in the lounge. So that's never happened before. Uh, so that definitely differs. But say this setup right now, we're doing this podcast and I'm chatting to you. I'm in a spare room. And this is where I do my Zoom stand-up gigs. Mm. And there's nothing weirder than saying goodnight to people and closing the laptop screen down. And then you're like, what am I going to do now? Whereas before the buzz was the travel to the gig, mm. what could possibly happen? Writing your notes down on a on piece of paper going, I want to do this joke, I want to try that. Yeah. And then after the gig, you have a beer with or, or a drink maybe with another comic or you're mm. rushing to another gig there was this adrenaline there was this buzz i was in london and now it's kind of like yeah i should actually hoover yeah I should hoover now. <laughs> it, that is not it's, 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 it's a massive come down yeah uh are you like yeah we'll put some dinner on and um I, but at the same time being able to connect with people is what i love about stand-up comedy and in the zoom gigs i might be hosting them and chatting to people and looking inside their their living room their lounge mm. their bedroom you, you you are connecting with people so so it has given me the outlet to connect but i haven't been able to feel like i've actually been working or, or feel like i'm getting that buzz from yeah from being somewhere else rather than my, my spare room 